Hi there and welcome back everyone. This is Advanced SQL and this is chapter 7. We have indeed reached the last chapter of this course. Greetings from Tatooine. Uh, this is the last chapter um, that will have a completely different view of expressing computation with SQL. If you look back what we have done in the recent six chapters is uh, discussing a query language that was centered around the evaluation of expressions. So SQL is an expression oriented language. We were evaluating scalar expressions to get hold of scalar values. We were expressing ex uh, evaluating tabular expressions to get hold of tables in particular select from where blocks. But it was all about the evaluation of expressions. So SQL in this sense is closer to a functional programming language than any other type of programming language that you might know. But uh, things will change in this particular chapter. This is chapter seven on procedural SQL. So we will take a completely different attempt at expressing complex algorithms, complex uh, computation close to the data. Of course, the overall goal that we have remains the same. It's still our goal to move more computation closer to the data. And recursion has been a key, has been a key construct in, uh, in our discussion of SQL, a key construct that allows us to express actually any computation in terms of SQL. Admittedly, the expression of recursion and formulating complex computation in terms of recursion in SQL can sometimes be rather unusual or maybe people would say it can turn out awkward. Well, that's not my view of things. I, I love the uh, expressive praxis, expressivity and the conciseness of SQL. But uh, well, there, is, there are different approaches to uh, complex computation and uh, procedural SQL constitutes one such different path towards the goal of moving complex algorithm closer to the data so that they are evaluated efficiently without extracting all the data and uh, externalizing it to some uh, external processor. All right, so uh, what we will do is uh, look at the language at uh, language that is commonly called PL SQL. So it's the procedural language extension to SQL that will allow us to express computation using, well, sequential steps in a computation. So first step, next step, next step. And these steps will be statements, not expressions, but really statements that compute values and then assign values to variables that perform state changes in our computation. This is what imperative and sequential programming is all about. This is the probably intuitive and natural programming style that most people and most developers out there follow. Procedural SQL allows you to adopt that programming style and exercise it in the context of a database. So uh, what we will see is that we will be talking about the constructs of a scripting language. So what we will discuss in the upcoming videos will be, well, it would be just like a tour through a scripting language, just like Python or Perl or Ruby maybe. But uh, well, the expressions inside that scripting language would use SQL to express computation. So we would still use SQL to express uh, to express computation to compute values, which we would then assign to variables, which we would use to design control flow decisions and so on. So SQL will still be a sub language in peer SQL. And that uh, that's a good idea because, uh, well, this will lead to a scripting language that indeed matches the idea of the tabular data model or the types of SQL which will be present in peer SQL or the operators all the functions, uh, all of this will be available in the expression sub language of PL SQL, which is, which is just SQL. So it's a good fit between a scripting language and the ideas of SQL itself. What it will allow us is to, to uh, uh, express complex computation that for now, some developers might have located outside the database system 
and it will allow us to move that computation inside the database system. And we have talked about the salient properties and opportunities and advantages that this promises uh, early in the beginning of the course and all over this course again and again. So uh, what we would hope is to move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side in this particular picture. Okay, so the left-hand side demonstrates what uh, what what uh, complex programs and complex computation over databases typically look like. So what you would have is a program expressed in your favorite procedural programming language executed from left to right here. So that would be the control flow through your program. Okay. Uh, this would be located outside the database system. The database system lives down here. You, the implementation of complex computational logic would be uh, outside the database system. So we would have to communicate with the database system to inform the program about the current state of the database. Well, we would do that by sending a query to the database. Query Q1 would be formulated, constructed by the program, sent to the database. And well, the database will send the result back to the program. And here at this particular gray block, that result would be available to the program. If your computation is indeed complex, then a single query might not suffice to extract all the, all the required or the necessary data. Okay, so we would probably send a second query at some particular point. Uh, this second query that may even depend on parts of the result of the first query and it may depend on the state of the program. We would send a second query and of course receive a second result that we would also collect in this gray block. And another query Q3 and again Q3 would return its individual result and uh, contribute it to its gray block. That gray block of course is a part of a program that stitches together these individual result, this individual query result stitches together to compute some final result that we can then further process in our program. So that would be a very typical back and forth between the program, the database that computes the result of, uh, of query Q1, Maybe it's uh, not too complex a query. We make up for that by sending multiple of these queries to perform some complex computation. Of course, this back and forth leads to invocation of the database, returning of data. It depends on, well, on the size of the data that is being returned on this path, uh, how efficient this communication is. If we are out of luck, then, well, then there might be a quite a number of rows that are communicated this way back into the program. All right, this is computation that is remote to the data. It's actually, it's actually divided this application scenario. Data lives down there, is extracted, and then only further processed here above the line in a world outside the database system. What we are aiming for is moving computation closer to the data. And that means we have some means, we have to have some means to express complex algorithms and complex computation closer to the data. Recursion in SQL is one such way to do that. Peer SQL, the procedural SQL uh, uh, variant, is another way to perform such complex computation. So what we would do is, of course, still write our program, but uh, when we invoke the database system to perform computation for us, what we would do is uh, not send a single query, but maybe invoke a function, a user-defined function that we have created. This function is called Q123 at this particular point, because uh, this name should, should suggest that actually the functionality of the individual queries, Q1, Q2, and Q3 is actually found inside the implementation of this user-defined function. We have to have a means to perform computation, then uh, analyze the result, react on that, perform some other computation, and then perform more computation. So this would be inherently sequel, uh, sequential, I'm sorry, inherently sequential. Uh, we would have to have uh, notions of control flow, of uh, state update, 
of iteration inside these bodies of these UDFs to express our complex algorithms. But in the end, Q123, our user-defined function, will compute one result, hopefully a compact result, a compact result that really needs only minimal post-processing by the receiving program. That result would be passed back once we would pass one result back and then have some hopefully minimal processing here on the side of the program uh, to uh, to receive or construct the final result. This is the uh, method, the approach, the strategy that we would like to pursue in moving computation closer to the data. And as it's already been indicated here in this chapter, we will look at the procedural way of constructing such UDFs, complex computation that is characterized by variables, statements, assignments, sequence, iteration, control for decisions, so all of the stuff that makes up a scripting language. All right, so this is on the table for this particular chapter seven of our advanced SQL course. Uh, I've already mentioned that uh, code in procedural SQL will be organized in functions or procedures that are actually living inside the DBMS. So it's no, it's no accident that the definition and actually also the code of Q123 has been relocated here into the database system. Right? Indeed, the code lives inside the database system and is being held persistently by the DBMS. If we shut down the DBMS and then later boot it up again, Q123 and all its other UDFs, uh, companion UDFs, will still be present in the state of the database. This, of course, implies that we will find uh, uh, DML statements like create procedure or create function to create such UDFs and have them stored uh, persistently. And also, of course, drop procedure or drop function to remove a defined UDFs from the current state of the database. So just like we were managing persistent data with create table and drop table, we will now create persistent computation with create function, create procedure and drop procedure. Uh, Right, so really the functions live tightly, neatly integrated with the data uh, they are operating over. Okay, once we have defined these function and procedures, these user-defined functions or UDFs, they may be used anywhere that a SQL built-in function would be used and could be used. All right, so these are not second class or third tier or whatever uh, 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 functions or procedures. Uh, these may be used wherever a SQL query would admit the invocation of a function or procedure, right? So any types that we have defined, for example, row types or particular domain types that we've introduced, they will be available for use in our UDFs, right? Other functions that we have uh, uh, defined earlier may, of course, be invoked. Special operators that uh, the system it defines by itself or that we have defined on our own uh, will be available to these UDFs. Remember, for example, our own implementation of equality for points. Of course, our UDFs could rely on this point equality to be usable and present when we implement the body of our UDFs. Right. We can use such UDFs indeed to define new operators or define new aggregate or window functions or what have you. So these are really tightly and neatly integrated with the rest of the SQL uh, subsystem of our DBMS. Much closer integration than any other scripting language could enjoy, right? Okay. Well, uh, when, we, when we find ourselves implementing such UDFs, what we will do is indeed create functions. Well, we have uh, created functions already in uh, the course of this uh, of this advanced uh, SQL uh, course, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be using a different language now to do that, right? So we have seen create function before, right? But uh, if you recall this, this, this postfix here, the trailer 
of the create function uh, statement, the DML statement create function, was mentioning a particular language that we were using, namely the SQL language. The body of the function that we were defining were expressed in SQL itself. Now we will use PSQL or rather a variant that PostgreSQL has defined for its use. So that would be the procedural language for PostgreSQL, right? So it's PLPG SQL. That's a quite unwieldy name here, but uh, well, we have to deal with that. So PLPG SQL, this will be the language that we will be uh, using as the implementation language. The blocks, the internal implementation, the real body of the function will be found inside uh, or between these double dollar signs here. Uh, a syntactic convention that we've already uh, uh, experienced when we were talking about SQL UDFs. All right, so we will probably uh, term our function Fs or whatever, they will have parameters. And of course, the types of these parameters, the tau1 to tau1 here, these will be regular types introduced or uh, as known to the SQL language itself. So we can share and use all the types that a regular SQL uh, query may use. And we may, of course, return values of such types. Uh, there is the restriction that the arguments, the arguments of such a UDFF here, have to be scalar or array or row types, all right? They may not be tabular types. This is what mentioned here below. We may return tab tables or tabular types uh, from our uh, functions. And this is indicated by uh, having a type that is called set of tau here. We have seen that convention before, and that's also possible for the lang for the function that I implemented in PLSQL. We may not receive tables as arguments here. That's a pity, but it's a restriction that we can uh, easily work around. Okay, there's even the possibility to define polymorphic functions f in uh, uh, in terms of using argument types, any element and any arrow array here. We have. Uh, seen that convention before when we were talking about SQL UDFs and we will see examples of implementing polymorphic uh, PL SQL UDFs in the upcoming videos. Okay, we may also be uh, in some sense be polymorphic when it comes to the return type here. We may for example just indicate that we return records. All right, then the caller must uh, our caller, the invoker of this function f, must make sure to uh, supply sufficient information about the fields and the field types of such records so that the rest of the query can process the result of our function f. We will see examples for that. Okay, but uh, it will be just imperative scripting based programming inside SQL. All right, and uh, what these blocks may contain, how they are constructed, how indeed. SQL scripting with PLSQL looks like, that will be the topic of the upcoming videos. And uh, I'm really looking forward to explore this with you. It really is a different taste of uh, SQL development and programming. Uh, looking forward to discuss this with you. Please stay tuned for the next videos. Bye-bye.